Hello everybody, welcome to another Biographics video. Just before we jump into it, a quick message from our sponsor. Now, you might have heard of the little YouTube channel, Cinema Sins. It's not really little at all. It's got like 8 million subscribers or something crazy like that. Well, the co-founder and narrator of that channel, Jeremy Scott, he wrote a book. In fact, he actually wrote two books. This one a while ago. This one, Strings, coming out real soon on the 24th of September. You can pre-order it now. This one, the original one, you can already get this wherever you get your books or just go to cinemasins.com forward slash books to find links to all of those places. These books follow a chap called Philip who basically attends a superhero school. He's a superhero. If you like, like superheroes and stuff and Disney and whatnot, then you're probably going to like this stuff. The plot twist is that super heroes can be disabled too. Indeed, Philip is blind. He's also got telekinesis, so, you know, pros and cons. Basically, these books, they're a really nice take on the superhero genre, offering just something a little bit different, a little bit inspiring. And here you are, you clicked on a video about Disney, so I don't think it's too much of a stretch to think that you will like these books. Like I say, you can order the first book right now. You can get this one on the 24th or pre-order it. Just go to cinemasins.com forward slash book and thanks to them for the sponsorship and let's get into it So today's highly recognizable protagonist was hailed as a genius of entertainment, a wizard of animation, a pioneer of technology and theme parks. The influence of Walt Disney on today's popular culture and collective imagination it cannot be understated. You can love him, you can hate him, or you can love to hate him, but you simply cannot ignore his work. Walt Disney once famously said that laughter is America's greatest export. But well, it's not. It's actually travel and transportation with $236 billion in sales in 2017. But sale of intellectual property, including TV and movies, amounts to $49 billion, which is still big. Indeed, it's twice the GDP of Cyprus. So if by laughter we mean entertainment, Entertainment, then yes, American entertainment is one of the country's most important exports. And these days, a good chunk of that intellectual property is owned by Walt Disney Studios, Pixar, Buena Vista, Miramax, plus the Marvel and Star Wars franchises are some of the largest and most visible entertainment companies owned by the House of Mouse. Disney's legacy it can capture the imagination of every girl or boy from early childhood all the way through adulthood. And to think, it all started with the doodle of a mouse sketched during a depressing train ride home. But, well, we're getting ahead of ourselves. Walter Elias Disney, later known as Uncle Walt, was born on December 5, 1901 in Chicago, Illinois. His parents, Flora and Eliza, were farmers and occasional entrepreneurs of Canadian origin. Walt was the youngest of five siblings, the others being Ruth, Roy, Raymond and Herbert. His much older brothers would prove a source of stability and inspiration later in life. At the age of seven, Walt and the Disneys they moved to Kansas City, where he spent most of his childhood. This was an unhappy period of his life, though Elias Sr. had a hard time making a living switching from farming to distributing newspapers. In each of these activities, Walt and his siblings were drafted to work hard and contribute to the family's welfare. Elias was a tough workmaster and did not approve of Walt trying to carve out time to do homework or even attend school. You can probably imagine how Elias took to his son's budding talents for drawing. He considered it a complete waste of time and would not spend a cent on something as futile as art supplies. Walter he was reduced to drawing his first sketches on toilet paper. Walt's harsh relationship with his father was mitigated by Walt's close relationship with his big brothers, especially Roy and Herbert, who were an early source of encouragement for him. Unfortunately, Roy, Raymond, and Herbert they moved out of the family home eventually, leaving behind the much younger Walt. In 1917, the U.S. joined the Entente in World War I. Alongside many other patriotic American boys, Walt longed to do his part by donning uniform to serve in France. He may have also had the added motivation to leave his home behind. Considering the fact that he faked his age to join the army at 16, Walt was likely trying to escape from his home life. Unfortunately, he was rejected for being too short. Walt had a plan B, though. He successfully applied to join the American Red Cross. While training as an ambulance driver, Walt developed his artistic skills and he became quite popular for decorating the ambulances with cartoons and caricatures of fellow paramedics. One of his fellow trainees, by the way, that was Ray Kroc, later the legendary CEO of McDonald's. Walt's appetite for action it remained unfulfilled. The war was over before he was even deployed overseas. But when he returned home, he had good reason to rejoice. He had found out that he had won a scholarship to attend the Kansas City Art Institute. 
Institute. After years of having to draw on toilet paper and ambulances, the poor guy, he did deserve a break. And at last, he got his proper art supplies. While attending the Art Institute, Walt developed a fascination for the growing genre of animation. Animated shorts were commonly used at the time in movie theaters as a crowd pleaser before the main feature. But they were crudely made, and the soundtrack was irrelevant, and some of them were pretty darn creepy. Walt saw an opportunity to fill a potential gap in the market with products of good quality. With a friend from the Art Institute, Ub Iwerks, Walt set up his first animation company. It was a bold move, considering that the two were 19 and had little to no capital to start with. Walt and Dub developed a series of short animated movies for the Newman chain of cinemas entitled Newman's Laughograms. The company it was short-lived, running from 1920 to 1923, but its cartoons were a hit with audiences. Walt experimented with some of the themes that would later become a staple of his production. Anthropomorphized animals, innovative takes on classic fairy tales, a keen eye for popular music, jazz at the time, and slapstick humor. As talented animators as Walt and Ub may have been, as businessmen well, they were kinda rubbish. The production costs of their shorts were too high, and they signed unfair distribution deals. They thought they'd hit the jackpot when a distributor company called Pictorial Clubs of Tennessee promised $11,100 for six cartoons. That's $142,000 in today's money. But Pictorial never paid, and the Laughogram company it soon went bankrupt. Interesting aside here: if today some Laughograms are still intact and available, it's thanks to those Pictorial Club scoundrels. They kept the six cartoons in their vaults and reissued them when Disney. Disney had become a household name. The fellow animator and other employees of Walt's startup, well, they were about to call it quits. But Walt had a brilliant idea with great potential. How about mixing live action with animation? Walt's pitch was to film a series of shorts starring actress Virginia Davis with an innovative technique, mixing a live action protagonist with animated characters and settings. Walt and Ub moved to California to start work on this new series entitled The Alice Comedies. Their early work attracted the attention of New York based distributor Margaret J. Winkler. Disney's work was again plagued by too high production costs, which made the first Alice comedies unprofitable. On Winkler's insistence, Walt and Ub were forced to increase their rate of production while lowering the animator's salaries. By this time, big brother Roy Disney had joined the company, and he seemed to have a much better business sense than Walt. He would remain his business partner and trusted advisor for the rest of his life. It was perhaps on Roy's advice that Walt and Ub decided to hire an entirely female crew of colorists. Traditional animation required for each frame of a cartoon to be colored by hand, and that's 24 frames per second of footage. So it's a meticulous, repetitive, time-consuming job requiring large numbers of skilled professionals. At that time, women's wages were much lower than men's, which meant savings for the Disney brothers. One of the colorists was a young woman from Idaho called Lillian. At the end of a long day's work, Walt would routinely drive home a group of his employees. Whatever the route, he would always make sure that the last person to be dropped off was Lillian so that he could spend more time alone with her. Lillian probably got the hints, and the two started dating, and this led to a short engagement and to their wedding in July of 1925. By 1927, American audiences had grown weary of the Alice comedy's shorts, and Walt wanted to diversify his production. He started working on a new character, Oswald the Lucky Rabbit. This series was successful, and Walt considered rescinding his contract with Margaret Winkler to chance distribution on his own. But in 1928, Walt discovered that Margaret and her husband, Charles Mintz, later of Universal Pictures, were masters of the fine print at the bottom of contract. During a business meeting in New York, he learned that as part of the deal with Winkler, every intellectual property developed within the terms of the contract would be legally owned by Winkler and Mintz. Unbeknownst to him, the New York power couple had another nasty trick in reserve. Their pushy demands and deadlines for the Alice films alienated Disney's animators. Most of them had vented their frustration against Walt rather than Winkler, so when they eventually quit the company, they were hired en masse by Universal. Only Iwerks would remain by Walt's side. While riding the train back to California from New York, a depressed Walt Disney put pencil to paper to soothe his sadness and frustration. Little did he know that Doodle would change his life and have a huge impact on the life of millions of children. The character that he sketched that day was the immortal Mortimer Mouse. So now you might be asking, well, Mortimer who? Well, that character was Mickey Mouse, but Walt's initial choice of name was Mortimer. Luckily, Lillian talked into his senses and advised that he change the name to Mickey. If you are into these sort of things, the name Mortimer is of old French origin and means Dead Sea, not exactly the cheeriest of names for a talking mouse. Walt's company was now called Walt Disney Cartoons, a skeleton crew which included only him and Ub on the drawing and animation duties, with Roy supervising the business and his wife and Edna coloring and 
inking with Lillian. The gang soon delivered three Mickey Mouse cartoons. The first two did not sell. For the third one, Walt had the intuition to add a recent cinematic innovation, a synchronized soundtrack which included a catchy whistling tune. This was Steamboat Willie. It opened on November 18, 1928, and it was an immediate success for Walt Disney cartoons. Finally, the big break had arrived, and the company would produce a string of hit animated shorts. In 1929, they created the cartoon series Silly Symphonies. An 1832 episode, Flowers and Trees, was the first cartoon to be produced in color and to win an Oscar. The follow-up, The Three Little Pigs of 1933, was so popular that it got top billing above the feature films that it accompanied. While working on the Silly Symphonies, Walt and Lillian were trying to conceive a child. Unfortunately, Lillian suffered several miscarriages, which caused Walt to experience a nervous breakdown. Eventually, a baby girl arrived in 1933, Diane. The Disneys decided to adopt another girl, Sharon, in 1936. The success of his cartoons and a growing family emboldened Walt, who now started to think a bit bigger. Why should cartoons be developed only in the short format? Why not produce a full-length animated film? In 1934, Walt started working on that very idea, a cartoon that ran for the length of a feature film. As he had done previously, Walt sought inspiration from a classic fairy tale, Snow White by the Brothers Grimm. Nobody in Hollywood believed in Walt. Among the studio lots, film executives sneered at the project, calling it Disney's folly. The production was not easy, going over time and over budget. But when Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs opened on December 21, 1937, it won immediately the hearts and minds of both audiences and critics. Including subsequent releases and adjusting for inflation, Snow White is the tenth highest grossing movie of all time. At the 1938 Academy Awards, the film was nominated for Best Soundtrack and received a special award for significant screen innovation in the shape of one normal-sized Oscar and seven little statuettes. Walt Disney Studios continued working on shorts, but the main production focus was firmly on feature-length cartoons. Walt's next two projects were incredibly ambitious. He released Pinocchio and Fantasia, both in 1940. Pinocchio was a relative success, not as astounding as Snow White, but, well, Fantasia, it tanked. If you haven't seen this movie, it is absolutely worth a watch. But 1940 audiences, they did not agree, and for the next production, Dumbo, Walt had to tighten the belt and reduce costs to a minimum. Dumbo's artwork and animation are visibly cruder than the three previous movies. The running time is also quite short, but the film it was highly profitable. This relative reduction in quality may have also been a consequence of a studio animator's strike, events which deeply angered and worried Disney. A 2006 biography of Walt Disney by Neil Gabler sheds some light on Walt's relationship with his employees, trade unions, and communism. To put it simply, Walt Disney was a tough boss to work for. It is no surprise that his employees wanted to organize themselves into a union, but he considered industrial action as a dangerous expression of communist tendencies. How about this for an example? When Walt turned 35, his brother Roy encouraged employees to throw the boss a surprise birthday party. Two of the animators thought it would be a fun idea to create a short cartoon out of Mickey and Minnie Mouse going at it. When Walt saw the animation at the party, he laughed hard and asked who'd made the film. The two animators stepped up, expecting a pat on the back or a handshake and then he fired them on the spot. In general, Walt could be controlling, and he asked a lot from his employees. He often dressed them down if they did not deliver. Even Roy was not spared. The business brains behind Walt Disney Studios was frequently scolded when he ventured an opinion on an artistic choice. Of his employees, animators and cartoonists were the ones subject to the longest hours and the most grueling work conditions. Taking a break was a luxury, as Walt would often appear suddenly in the drawing rooms to check on their work. Luckily for the employees, Walt was a heavy smoker. With time, he developed a persistent cough that that announced his arrival by just a few seconds. When his cartoonists tried to form a union, Walt reacted by hiring armed guards, firing organizers, and cutting wages. And when a major strike rolled around in 1941, well, he was really asking for it. On July 2, 1941, Disney published an advert in Variety accusing the strike leaders of communistic agitation. This concern about communist infiltrations in Hollywood led him to join the Motion Picture Alliance for the Preservation of American Ideals, or the MPA. Founded in February of 1944, the MPA was an organization composed of high-profile showbiz personalities with the purpose of defending Hollywood and America as a whole against communism and fascism. The MPA was active until 1975, and notable members included John Wayne, Ronald Reagan, and Ginger 
Ginger Rogers, just to name a few. The MPA volunteered to testify in front of the House Committee on Un-American Activities. The committee was created in 1938 to investigate alleged disloyalty and subversive activities on the part of private citizens, public employees, and organizations suspected of having communist ties. Walt also participated in the hearings of the committee, accusing several leaders of the animators' strike as communist agitators. His testimony earned him the gratitude and friendship of legendary FBI director J. Edgar Hoover, whose life story we're sure to tell here sooner or later. Hoover and Disney they developed a strange artistic partnership. In the following years, J. Edgar allowed Walt Disney Studios to film some of their live-action movies at the FBI headquarters in Washington. Walt, on the other hand, agreed to submit some of his scripts to Hoover for an early revision to ensure that the FBI was depicted correctly. But apparently, Hoover did not make any changes to the classic animated films. In addition to these exchanges of favors, Hoover and Disney appointed as a special agent in charge of contact in 1954. In other words, a trusted informer and collaborator of the FBI. And here's for a fun fact. Decades after Walt Disney's death, his company would pay homage to the FBI chief with a minor character, Jay Gander Hooter, from the TV series Darkwing Duck. In the 1950s, Walt Disney eventually distanced himself from the MPA, as he lost interest in their ideas and their paranoid approach to anti-communism. Walt's association with the MPA is the source of the rumor that he was anti-Semitic, but biographer Neil Gabler, otherwise a harsh critic of Disney's, dismisses this claim as unsubstantiated. Walt regularly hired or had business with Jewish employees and colleagues. In 1955, he was even appointed Man of the Year by the B'nai B'rith International, a Jewish cultural organization. This is not the only persistent, unfounded rumor on Walt, but we've got a bit more on that later. In the 1950s and 1960s, Walt Disney Studios produced a series of animated masterpieces that won well-deserved popular success. Let's list them quickly because I know if I miss one, I'm going to get some backlash. Cinderella, 1950, Alice in Wonderland, 1951, Peter Pan, 1953, Lady and the Trap, 1955, Sleeping Beauty, 1959, 101 Dalmatians, 1961, and Mary Poppins from 1964. Everybody has a favorite from one of these films. Mary Poppins successfully merged live action and animation in color. Before that, Disney Studios had ventured into purely live action films, the first one being Treasure Island in 1950. Disney was also one of the first Hollywood producers to invest in TV. The first of his series on the small screen was The Magical World of Disney, which actually can be considered an early example of content marketing to promote a good or service. So what was Disney promoting? Well, that was his next big dream, the one that would take most of his energy and attention for the last decade of his life. It was a massive and innovative theme park in Southern California. Of course, that's Disneyland. The park was developed in the town of Anaheim after demographics experts convinced Walt that it would become a major population center within the next 10 years. Time would prove they were absolutely right when the local population and park visitors soared. Disneyland opened on July 17, 1955, and its first day was a disaster. 30,000 people turned up instead of the projected 15,000, meaning restaurants were soon out of food and drink. A plumber strike also forced Walt to choose to either have flushing toilets or working drinking fountains. He went with the toilets. Further, one of the attractions was so overgrown with weeds that Disney ordered to place placards around with Latin names on them. He was essentially disguising the shrubbery as an arboretum. Of course, everything improved with time, and Disneyland became one of the most visited and successful theme parks in the world. When looking at visitor stats, Disney realized that only a small fraction came from the West Coast. That's when he got the idea of building a sister park in Florida, Disney World, developed around the prototype of a futuristic perfect city called Epcot. But Walt Disney would not live to see his new dream come true. For most of his adult life, he had been smoking three packs of unfiltered cigarettes every single day. His daughter Diane tried and failed to convince him to cut back. They reached a compromise. He would at least smoke three packs of filtered cigarettes, but he just removed the filters behind Diane's back. Inevitably, in 1966, Walt was diagnosed with lung cancer. He underwent surgery, but due to post-operative complications, Walt had a heart attack and died on December 15, 1966 at the age of 65. Contrary to popular and persistent rumors, his body was not cryogenically preserved and or hidden in a vault under Disneyland. Walt was simply cremated and his ashes were interned at Forest Lawn Cemetery in Los Angeles, California.
So I hope you'll forgive me for stating the obvious, but Walt Disney was, and still is, a controversial figure, as is normal for somebody whose influence on the surrounding world and society is larger than life. A personality like Disney will never be free from exaggeration, slander, and rumors, or the opposite risk is to portray him exclusively in a saintly light. For sure, Walt Disney was not the fairest of business leaders, not the most balanced of workplace bosses, not the most level-headed when confronted with different political ideas. But it's also true that he did deliver a lasting impact on society, culture, and children through his innovative work. As Walt once said, I'd rather entertain and hope that people learn than teach and hope that people are entertained. So I really hope you found that video interesting. If you did, please do hit that thumbs up button below and don't forget to subscribe. Also, remember you can grab this book at cinemasins.com forward slash book. You can pre-order it right now. It's released on the 24th of September. So if it's after the 24th of September and you're watching this, well, great, you can grab it now. But until then, pre-order at cinemasins.com forward slash book and I'll see you next time.